everyone, this is Amanda McDonough. I'm here with Ben, Emmy, Max, and Addie. And today's scripture reading is from Isaiah 38, 1 through 20. In those days, Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. The prophet Isaiah, son of Amoz, went to him and said, This is what the Lord says. Put your house in order because you are going to die. You will not recover. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord. Remember, Lord, how I have walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion and have done what is good in your eyes. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Then the word of the Lord came to Isaiah. Go and tell Hezekiah, This is what the Lord, your, the God of your father David says. I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will add 15 years to your life, and I will deliver you in this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. I will defend this city. This is the Lord's sign to you that the Lord will do what he has promised. I will make the shadow cast by the sun go back the ten steps it has gone down on the stairway of Ahaz. So the sunlight went back to the ten steps it had gone down. A writing of Hezekiah, king of Judah, after his illness and recovery. I said, In the prime of my life must I go through the gates of death and be robbed of the rest of my years? I said, I will not again see the Lord himself in the land of the living. No longer will I look on my fellow man or be with those who now dwell in this world. Like a shepherd's tent, my house has been pulled down and taken from me. Like a weaver, I have rolled up my life, and he has cut me off from the loom. Day and night, you made an end of me. I waited patiently till dawn, but like a lion, he broke all my bones. Day and night, you made an end of me. I cried like a swifter thrush. I moaned like a morning dove. My eyes grew weak as I looked to the heavens. I am being threatened. Lord, come to my aid. But what can I say? He has spoken to me, and he himself has done this. I will walk humbly all my years because of the anguish of my soul. Lord, by such things pe people live, and my spirit finds life in them too. You restored me to health and let me live. Surely it was for my benefit that I suffered such anguish. In your love you kept me from the pit of destruction. You have put all my sins behind your back. For the grave cannot praise you. Death cannot sing your praise. Those who go down to the pit cannot hope for your faithfulness. The living, the living, they praise you as I am doing today. Parents tell their children about your faithfulness. The Lord will save me and we will sing with stringed instruments all the days of our lives in the temple of the Lord. God bless the reading of his word. Amen. Hezekiah served as a good and faithful king. He started at the age of 25, taking over from his wicked father, King Ahaz. And he made a lot of reforms, and he made a lot of improvements to the way the people behaved in the kingdom of God. But at the age of 39, right at the height of all his activity, he faced a life-threatening illness. In fact, Isaiah gave him a word from the Lord that he was not going to survive this illness. And he suddenly had the opportunity to have an extended 14 years of life. And this poem that Amanda read to us is his reflection after he recovered. I sit in awe before this poem where he praises God for the severe mercy of his life-threatening illness. Look again at verse 17. Surely it was for my benefit that I suffered such anguish. This is a deep shaft down into God's word. How are trials for my benefit? Let me lay out five ways that trials can benefit us. I hope you have your sermon notes. Mike mentioned earlier, hillcrest.church slash bulletin is where you can find it on your mobile device. And so you can find some sermon notes there. And, and there's five ways that suffering can make us better people. I'm using the word can instead of will. There's no assurance that suffering will make us better people necessarily. Somebody said one time experience is the best teacher, but that's not necessarily true. It all depends on what kind of student experience has to teach. But the reality is that there are some things that can happen to our lives when we sit under this professor called suffering. So let's write them down. First of all, it can make us bold. It can make us bold. A greater boldness in what we ask of God is never a bad thing. And it's often in the fire of suffering that a greater boldness is forged. Now, as I mentioned before, Hezekiah was right in the middle 
of a productive life when at the age of 39 he was laid low by this illness and it was an illness from which Isaiah said he was not going to recover now imagine th this would be much like a, a football player who uh, finishes up the halftime break and gets his helmet and heads out onto the field ready to begin the second half only to inexplicably hear the two minute warning right away that must have been the way Hezekiah felt at this particular point. And yet, here we see this remarkable boldness. When God told him through Isaiah that he was going to die, Hezekiah said, I'm not ready yet. And God uh, sent Isaiah back to give him a new word from the Lord that he would be given an additional 15 years of life. He said, I've seen your tears. I've heard your prayer. I'm going to heal you and give you more time. You know, the reality is that for some of us, we are not bold people and we sanctify our timidity. We sanctify our resignation and despair. Uh, what I mean by that is some of us, we've given up on the, th the, th the thought that life could possibly be better. We've given up on that, and yet we say it in the most sanctimonious way, well, I've just learned to trust God. I've, I've just learned to, to yield to his inevitable will in my life. Now, the reality is that we do need to learn how to yield to the inevitable will of God in our lives. But let's make sure that that's what we are doing. We're yielding ourselves to God's will, not just letting uh, our despair and our resignation be masked over by pious-sounding words. I, I remember a, a parable that Jesus told one time about a poor widow who continued to press her case day after day in front of an unjust judge. Do you remember that story? Jesus was uh, sharing this parable one day and he talked about this widow who in desperation kept going before this judge who did not care for her, did not care for her case, but finally in consternation, fed up with her, he just granted her wish so that she would quit bothering him. Now, in this parable, Jesus was not telling us anything about the character of God. He wasn't saying that God is as unjust and as uncaring as this judge was in the story. He wasn't telling us anything about the character of God, but he was trying to tell us something about our character. Our character needs to be like this widow, where we continue to press our case, where we continue to call out to God and cry out to God until he, the loving and good king, responds to us. Jesus didn't always give reasons for his parables. He usually let the listeners sort of work it out for themselves. But in this particular parable, we are told that the reason for the parable is that we should always pray and not give up. Now, Hezekiah is an example of someone who exhibited this kind of boldness. He pressed his case into God. Look at verse 3 again. Remember, O Lord, how I've walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion and have done what is good in your eyes. You know, some people might think that what Hezekiah was doing here was bargaining. You know, God, I've been good to you. I've done the things you wanted me to do. It's time for you to come through for me now. But that's not what's happening in this particular passage. Instead, I think Hezekiah was saying, God, I just don't see myself as done yet. Here are all these things that I've been doing for your glory. I want to keep doing them for your glory. And in this particular instance, God said, I've seen your tears. I've heard your prayer. I'm going to grant your request. God even gave him a remarkable sign. Uh, the passage says that God made the shadow on the steps of Ahaz go back 10 steps. Now, scholars aren't exactly sure what the steps of Ahaz are. It was obviously some sort of sundial that was built during the days of King Ahaz before Hezekiah came along. But what was happening with this miracle was God was saying to Hezekiah, I'm going to give you more years in your life, and as proof of this, as a sign of this, I'm going to give you more hours in this day. So Hezekiah, what we're seeing in the story of Hezekiah was a man saying, God, I'm, I'm not ready to be done yet. I'm not finished with the task that you gave me. Can we talk about this? And God responded dramatically to Hezekiah's desperate prayer. Now, I don't want you to get the wrong impression. By no means am I saying that if you have had unanswered prayer in your life, it was your fault. You needed to be bolder. You needed to be more audacious before God, and he would have done something for you. I'm not saying that at all. There are numbers of stories in the Bible about prayer. There are stories in the Bible about timid and hesitant people who experienced 
the miraculous intervention of God. There are stories in the Bible about people who were bold and audacious in their request to God who had their request left unanswered. But in this particular account, in this particular story, in Hezekiah's desperation, he cried out to God, and God responded by answering his prayer. It is so often the case that when we are in suffering, when the props get knocked out from underneath us, when the wheels fall off our wagon, that's when we're desperate enough to see if this access to God that we've read about in the Bible is really actually ours. And what Hezekiah does in this passage is he accesses that access to God boldly. And this is one of the things that we can learn in the midst of our suffering. So when Hezekiah said it was for my benefit that I suffered such anguish, I think one of the benefits that we gain in suffering is we remember again this access we have to God through our relationship with him. And we make use of it in a way that maybe we haven't done in a long, long time until we're desperate. Here's the second thing to write down. It can make us humble. It can make us bold before the reality of a great God, but it can also make us humble before the reality of frailty and fragility in life. Now, in verses 9 through 20, Hezekiah is reflecting on his life-threatening illness, and at first, it doesn't look like a song of thanksgiving. It looks like a song of lament. Over and over again, he talks about how frail and fragile he realized his life was. But any one of us in here who have faced something life-threatening know exactly what's taking place here. If you have ever walked away from a car wreck and you've looked at the pictures later on and you thought, how did I survive that? If you have ever walked away from a doctor's office realizing with gratitude that what you thought was a death sentence is now suddenly going to be an extension of life, there's no evidence of the disease, you know exactly what's happening here. You're, at first, of course, you're relieved, but there's, you're sobered as well. You're sobered by the fact that you've just come to realize that you're not bulletproof after all. You've come to realize that life has a finality to it. Life has an ending to it. It's an incredibly fragile thing. And so that's why Hezekiah talks about, he said, I realize that my life is nothing more than a tent, a shepherd's tent that gets folded up eventually. My life is nothing more than a weaver's pattern to be cut off from the loom. And so he says in verse 15, I will walk humbly all my years because of this anguish of my soul. That's what severe illness can do. It can make us humble and the reality of the fragility and the brevity of life. Well, that humility can lead to another lesson. So Hezekiah said, surely it was for my benefit that I suffered such anguish. What were the benefits that came to him? Boldness and also humility. And third, it can make us thankful. It can make us thankful. Now, like I said, the poem doesn't start off as a psalm of thanksgiving. It starts off, it, it seems, as a psalm of lament. Uh, because he's been sobered deeply by how brief life really is and how fragile life really is. And so there are, he piles memorable phrases on top of memorable phrases to help us understand this. Look at verse 10. Hezekiah says, In the prime of my life must I go through the gates of death and be robbed of the rest of my years? You're going to feel that anywhere along in life when you get a life-threatening illness, but especially at the age of 39. He uses this word robbed. Will I be robbed? It's interesting the word robbed, it, 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 comes from an, uh, it, it comes from an old English word, bereft. To be bereft of something means to be robbed, to have it unjustly taken from you. The word bereft is where we get the current English word bereavement. When you are bereaved, when you are grieving over the loss of a loved one or the loss of the future years of your own life, what are you doing? You are sensing that you have been robbed unjustly of that which you really ought to have had. So that's what he's saying here in verse 10. Look at verse 11. He goes on to say, I will not again see the Lord himself in the land of the living. No longer will I look on my fellow man or be with those who now dwell in this world. Now note, he doesn't have anything to say here about fellowship with the Lord and fellowship with other people into the next life. At this juncture and the unfolding of God's revelation of himself and revelation of his will, there was somewhat of a question mark in several of the Psalms and several of the Old Testament passages about what life was like beyond this life. But there's no question that he is grieving over the fact that he's not going to have fellowship with God in this life anymore if he dies. He's not going to have fellowship with people in this life anymore if he dies. Again, look at verses 13 and 14. 
He said, I waited patiently till dawn, but my eyes grew weak as I looked to the heavens. I'm being threatened, Lord. Come to my aid. What's he doing there? He's saying, I kept thinking I'd feel better, but every morning I wake up and I still feel lousy. Every morning I wake up and I'm not delivered. I'm not rescued. We've all felt like that. In verse 14, he talks about crying like a swift or a thrush, moaning like a morning dove. He's, he's comparing his emotions to the call of different birds, sometimes quiet, sometimes shrill, sometimes mournful. Every one of us can, I think, identify with the description of suffering that he lays out here. And, and yet there's this change in tone, verses 15 and 16. He says, but what can I say? He has spoken to me. And he himself has done this. You restored me to health, and you let me live. So Hezekiah complained to God during his illness, and then he thanked God at his rescue from illness. Do we do both of those things, or do we just do one of those things? Now, the reality is that some of us are hesitant to complain to God when things aren't going right in our lives, and that's mostly because we haven't taken seriously that about a third of the Psalms in the Old Testament are songs of complaint, songs of lament. And those songs are in our Bible to let us know that God's got big shoulders. He knows what's in our heart anyway when we're bitter or when we're frustrated about things. So we need to express it. We need to let it out to him and have a conversation with him about it. That's what you do with genuine friends. If you're not so certain about the relationship you have with somebody, you're not really always honest with them. But if you're confident in the durability of that relationship, you're going to talk with them about things that you don't feel are fair, things that you don't feel are right. And Hezekiah does this in this passage. But Hezekiah also thanks God. Some of us were hesitant to complain, and the, the, the Bible lets us know, this passage lets us know, it's all right to do that, we need to do that. Some of us, however, once that prayer is answered, once the ship is righted once again, we don't for a moment think to thank God for that experience. So we need to be thankful people and suffering and the release from suffering can make us thankful people. Here's number four. It can make us wake up. It can make us wake up. What I mean is when we face a threat to life, it can make us more alive to the life that we actually have, more alive to the years that we still have left. How many books, how many movies are based upon this theme where somebody gets into an accident and they survive it, or they face a life-threatening illness and they survive it, and they walk back into life with a new gratitude, they walk back into life determined to accomplish the things they've been neglecting. Don't you think that one of the reasons we like the plots of those novels and, and, and the plots of those, those movies so much is because that's been our experience, or we would like to think it would be our experience after facing a crisis that we have this new appreciation for the opportunities we have in this life. In verse 16, that's what Hezekiah says. He says, Lord, by such things men live, and my spirit finds life in them too. You restored me to health and let me live. By such things, he wrote. What things? Uh, God restored him to health. God let him live. And he said, my spirit finds life in this reality. In other words, what he was saying is life is now more vivid to me. It's more consequential to me. It's more precious to me. I took it for granted before, but I don't anymore. He awakened to the reality of life. So he says, it was for my benefit that I suffered such anguish. What were the benefits? Boldness toward God, humility toward the brevity of life, thankfulness for the relief that God gave him in his illness, a new appreciation, a new aliveness toward life. And then number five, suffering can make us influential. In verse 19, he says, the living, the living, they praise you as I am doing now. Parents tell their children about your faithfulness. So in the intimate circle of his family, in the larger circle of his faith community and his nation, he became somewhat of an authority on the character of God and the promises of God and the goodness of God. I imagine he taught those things before he faced this illness. I imagine now, though, he had a platform on which to display those things. This is something that you and I need to pay attention to as well. We've tried to witness to a member of our family. We've tried to share our faith with somebody who's important to us in the community. We try to talk about Jesus with a friend. But so often it seems the case, it's only when we go through suffering, it's only when we go through difficulty 
that all of a sudden God's glory gets put on our stage and people get a chance to see that we mean business when we say we believe the character of God and the promises of God and the goodness of God. Suffering can make us influential in a way that we were never before. So, Hezekiah reports, Surely it was for my benefit that I suffered such anguish. This, more than any other thing Hezekiah did in his life, shows why he was such a good and great and well-remembered king. And yet, there's even a better king than Hezekiah in the Bible. In the line of Hezekiah, his name is King Jesus. I want you to think about this. Hezekiah and Jesus had some things in common. Hezekiah and Jesus both had their lives threatened at midlife. Well, Jesus wasn't quite at midlife. He was about 33, 34 years of age. Hezekiah was 39. But then there were some remarkable differences between the experiences of these two kings, these two men. You look at this passage and you see that Hezekiah said that he feared in his illness that he was about to be cast down into Sheol, the realm of the dead. But Jesus didn't just fear that. He actually experienced that. Hezekiah said he feared his life was going to be pulled up and folded up like a shepherd's tent. He feared that. But that actually happened to Jesus, the good shepherd. Hezekiah said that he feared his life was about to be rolled up like an unfinished tapestry, tapestry, cut off the loom and rolled up like an unfinished tapestry of a weaver. But Jesus was cut off. He was cut off from God to the point that in the cross he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But the biggest difference between Hezekiah's life-threatening moment and Jesus' life-threatening moment was this. Hezekiah said, surely it was for my benefit that I suffered such anguish. Jesus said, surely it was for your benefit that I suffered such anguish. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. What is a ransom? You've seen enough movies to know that when somebody is kidnapped, somebody has to pay a ransom to set them free. Jesus was saying that his death on the cross was going to be a ransom that was paid, so to speak, to set us free from sin and buy us for himself. And so it is for our benefit that we go through suffering. It is for our benefit that Jesus went through his suffering. And as we receive that and reflect on that, we begin to gain the benefits of going through our suffering as well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this chance to look at an Old Testament king and a New Testament king today, to look at an Old Testament king and learn what, it's, what can be learned, gain what can be gained through suffering. But we thank you also for the work of Jesus, the New Testament king, whose suffering was for our benefit whose suffering was to ransom us, to buy us out of kidnapping from sin and death so that we might enjoy uh, forgiveness and enjoy eternity. And I pray, Lord, that everyone who, who's hearing these words would respond to you and, and receive you into their hearts, receive the work of the cross into their lives so that they be, could begin to experience the goodness and the promises of God. And for those of us who are believers, I pray, Lord, that you would enable us in the midst of our suffering, not in spite of our suffering, but even in the midst of it, to see what you're up to, to see what you're about, and to, to take the lessons from it that you intend us to take. We pray these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. In that online bulletin, hillcrest.church slash bulletin, you'll see a connection card. Mike mentioned it earlier, but I want you to return to it at this time. Now, uh, if you regularly attend our service, we would like you to fill this out, yeah, every single week with just your name and your email address. But if you're a guest of ours today, we'd love for you to fill it out with even some more information. If you're a guest online, fill it out with even some more information, a mailing address or how you found out about our church and so on. And if you have a decision to make or you're curious about uh, making a decision for Christ or joining up with this church, you can check one of those boxes on the connection card and let us know about how we can follow up and talk with you about those important things.